The philosophy of time is a branch of philosophy that explores fundamental questions about the nature, existence, and experience of time. It has been a subject of contemplation and debate by philosophers, scientists, and theologians for centuries. In this two-part series, we will explore the general areas of the philosophy of time, which is generally speaking divided into two sections. First, time as we experience it, or the phenomenology of time, and second, time as it is, or the ontology and metaphysics of time. In the first part of this series, we talked about the phenomenology of time and how different cultures over the centuries have expressed and view time. We discussed the difference between circular versus linear time and the metaphysical implications of both of those. In this episode, we will talk more about the ontology of time and the different models of time that have been developed by philosophers and physicists alike. We will discuss a paper by the British philosopher McTaggart titled The Unreality of Time, explore distinctions in the metaphysics of time, including A theory versus B theory, substantivism versus relationalism, and the different models such as presentism versus eternalism, and how these relate to sort of cosmological understanding of time as a whole. I hope that you enjoy this video and I would be very curious as to which model you think most accurately describes reality and your general thoughts on the metaphysics and the ontology of time. Thanks for watching and enjoy the video. All right, welcome back everyone. So in the first part of this series, we discussed what is generally called the phenomenology of time. And again, phenomenology refers to how things appear to us. So the phenomenology of time, I said, could be divided into kind of two predominant theories or models that have been developed over the centuries in different places and by different cultures. We have this understanding of linear time versus circular time, and we talked about philosophical descriptions of each of those. In this video, we're going to move more from phenomenology or how, how time appears to metaphysics and a branch of metaphysics called ontology which concerns itself with what time actually is. I'll go ahead and warn you that in this video, I'm going to be using a lot of jargon. That's because the philosophy of time is very jargon laden, but I'll do my best to explain all of the terms that I've used and that I will be using. And as always, if you have any questions about anything that I've said, you're more than happy to leave a comment. Or if you're a student of mine, of course, shoot me an email and we can kind of walk through this together. All right, like I said before, we're going to be talking about metaphysics and ontology. So let me begin by explaining what these terms mean. So if you recall my introduction to philosophy video, I said that philosophy as a discipline can be divided into different branches or sections. So we have logic, ethics, epistemology, and metaphysics. Metaphysics deals with questions of what is, questions of existence, what exists, what doesn't exist, what is possible to exist. So classically, metaphysics has taken up questions such as the existence of God, the existence of the soul, of the spiritual realm, however you want to frame that. Now, the metaphysics of time specifically is a branch of philosophy that explores the nature of time or the different characteristics that time may or may not have and the relationship of time to the rest of reality. The metaphysics of time delves into questions related to the nature, existence, and property of time, as well as the implications for how our different models of time that we'll talk about what sort of implications that those have for the nature of reality as such. There are several different uh, theories within the metaphysics of time concerning time, and we'll kind of spend this video breaking those down together. So if you can think of metaphysics as the general category, ontology is a subset of metaphysics. And ontology deals specifically with questions of existence. So going back to those classical metaphysical questions, such as does God exist? That's an ontology. God's existence or non-existence is a question of ontology, of being. And we get similar sorts of questions with respect to time. But already we can go ahead and make some distinctions here because some philosophers believe that there is an ontology of time or that time is something that can have an ontology in the same way that God is something that can have an ontology, and other philosophers who would say that there is no such thing as the ontology of time because time has no properties or no universal characteristics to it. But we have metaphysics deals with questions of what is, what is possible, what exists, what doesn't exist, and ontology, a subset of metaphysics that deals specifically with questions of existence. So let's go ahead and get into the ontology of time. 
Now to start us off, I wanna raise a little bit of a thought experiment and a question to kind of help us think through what exactly the ontology of time means. And how you answer this question will also begin to give you some insight into what you think the ontology of time is and will hopefully illuminate these different positions. So to start us off, what is time? Now, one of the classic answers to this question is that time is change or that time is in some way, shape or form fundamentally associated with change. So we can also phrase this as does change equal time or is change time? Does change cause time or is it possible to have time without change? Is time separate and distinct from change? And one of the thought experiments we can use here to help us explore this is, and you can think about this for a second and maybe write down your own response, what would happen if time stopped? You can think about this in terms of the context of like a movie or anime or comic book. You have characters that can control and manipulate time. But think about it in the context of the real world. If somebody actually had that sort of power, what would happen? if somebody stopped time? Would like everything freeze? Would things slow down? Would the individual be able to move? What would happen to like cars going down the highway and planes flying through the air? What do you think would happen? Now, the reason why this is an important question with respect to ontology, because if it is possible for there to be time without change, if time is separate and distinct from the processes of change itself, then time is in some important sense independent of the events which happen in time. And an event can refer to anything. So we have a picture here of somebody kicking a soccer ball. An event is the action of the kick itself, as well as the trajectory of the ball traveling through the air. So let's say that you were a soccer coach and you were watching one of your players attempt to make goals and you timed the process of them making contact with the ball to them kicking the ball and an attempt to make it into the goal. Let's say you're trying to measure their performance or I know nothing about soccer, so this probably doesn't make sense, but you're, you're timing it. So does that time, now you're also measuring the time, but does the time itself, is it dependent upon the actions of the player? Is it dependent upon the change that is taking place? Or would it be possible for that time to exist apart from that change? And depending upon your answer to that question is going to determine your position on one of the most important distinctions within the ontology of time, the distinction between these two positions, substantivism and relationalism. So we'll talk about these two positions in a little bit more depth at the end of this video, but it's worth going over them now because when we talk about the models of time and what those different models mean, it'll kind of rely heavily upon these two distinctions between substantivism and relationism. And depending upon where you fall into these two groups is going to depend upon what sort of models are more appealing to you, or what sort of models you can even accept in the first place. So substantivism very quickly is the position that time is an independent and objective entity or substance that exists in its own right. That is, it exists separate from events, objects, or the universe itself. In other words, according to substantivism, time is not merely a measurement or relational concept, rather it has its own existence, akin to how space is conceived as having an independent existence. So in much the same way that you are able to move around in space as an individual, some substantivists will argue that time itself is a, is a container or is an entity in which people can also move around, as we'll see with representations such as Newton. Relationism, in contrast to substantivism, is that denies any sort of absolute or independent time. Instead, the relationist position considers time not as an objective and universal entity that flows uniformly, but rather argues that time is fundamentally relative and dependent upon various factors, such as the observer's perspective, physical processes, and even interactions with space, such as gravity, can have an impact on time and our perception of time. Now, historically speaking, with respect to both philosophy and science, there have been different representatives of these two positions throughout the century, perhaps the most famous of which of the substantivist position would be Plato and Newton. Both of these thinkers argued in some way that time is independent of events and believed in a form of absolute time. Isaac Newton was probably the most 
most famous proponent of this in his Principia, in which he outlines his theory of gravity as dependent upon notions of absolute time and space. Time for Newton is a, can be viewed as sort of like an empty container in which things and events may be placed, but the container is not dependent upon the events which happen in it. It's separate and distinct from those events. In other words, if you had no events that took place in a Newtonian universe, you would still have time. On the relational side, Aristotle and Leibniz are probably the most famous example in the modern and pre-modern world of relationist accounts of time, both of whom argue that time is not independent or separate from the events which occur in time. Sometimes this view is called reductionism, that it is reductionism with respect to time, since according to this view, all talk that appears to be about time can somehow be reduced to talk about temporal relations amongst things and events. So we're kind of going to shift gears here historically from talking about historical representations and arguments about time and moving into the 20th century. And in the 20th century philosophy of time, there are two kind of important I don't know what to call, call these events that happen that will shape discussions about the philosophy of time, but I'm going to kind of put these into two camps. The first are the developments that happen in physics at the turn of the 20th and mid 20th century. Most importantly here is Einstein and his theory of relativity and the implications that carried for our discussions of time. And the second is a paper that's written by a British philosopher named McTaggart called The Unreality of Time. And this paper is important, as we'll see, because it kind of sets a lot of this terminology in place and a lot of the language that's used is language that we're still using to talk about time. So let's talk a little bit about those two things. I've talked a lot about Einstein in my channel, I think, at this point I have three or four videos that discuss various aspects of the history of science and the history of relativity specifically. It's a concept that's been fundamental to my thesis writing and the philosopher that I study, Gaston Bachelard. Einstein's an essential component to the development of his philosophy of time. But I'm just going to say a little bit here because it'll especially set up when we talk about these different models of time, different approaches, and why these models are formed the way they are. So there are certain points in the history of science where our understanding of even the most basics of concepts are, will radically change. The philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, called these paradigm shifts. Famous examples could be the Copernican revolution, the move from a geocentric to a heliocentric universe, the Darwinian revolution, the understanding that all biological life on Earth had evolved and is still in the process of evolution, and perhaps the most famous example is what Einstein did in the early 20th century, beginning with a series of papers that he wrote in 1905. In one paper in particular, titled The Electrodynamics of Moving Bodies, fundamentally upends some basic temporal categories that most of us prior to Einstein would say that is kind of like a common sense sort of thing. And the common sense category that Einstein upends in this paper is this idea of simultaneity. So what does it mean for two events to happen at the same time? Even if you were to ask an elementary school student, a five-year-old, what does it mean for two things to happen at the same time? They'd be able to give you some sort of explanation about this. It's just something that's intuitively, that we kind of intuitively understand even from a young age. But what Einstein says is that our intuitive or phenomenological understanding of simultaneity is on a very basic level misleading and could potentially be wrong. So Einstein has this famous thought experiment. And in this thought experiment, it, it's kind of pictured here. You have two individuals, one individual that's standing still on the ground or on a stationary platform. And he's watching another individual who's in a speeding train. So the first individual is staying still and the other individuals on this train. And we have from the perspective of the still individual, a simultaneous event event, a lightning strike, lightning strikes at both point A and point B at the same time. Now, the wrench that Einstein's going to throw into this is this idea that the faster that a person is moving, 
the closer an individual approaches a speed of light, the slower certain events will appear to that individual. So in, in this scenario, the individual that's on the train, the person that's not on the train will see the lightning strike at point A and point B at the same time. But the person who's moving on the train, let's say that the train is approaching the speed of light, will actually see the lightning strike at point B before they'll see the lightning strike at point A. Now, the upshot of this thought experiment is hopefully apparent. The upshot here is that absolute simultaneity doesn't exist, that when events happen in time can be directly impacted by things such as motion to the extent that from the individual's perspective who is moving very fast, time will move at different speeds or paces compared to the individual who is standing still. Another way that this is represented in a thought experiment developed by Einstein is the twin thought experiment in which you have these a set of identical twins. One of the twins stays on Earth. The other twin goes in a rocket ship, is launched out of Earth's orbit, and let's say flies around outside of the solar system and does some scientific experiments or something. I don't know, however you want to phrase that. But when the twin who is in the rocket ship comes back to Earth, Einstein says that that twin in the rocket ship will appear to be roughly the same age, while the twin who remained on Earth would have aged perhaps even significantly. And the implications of the theory of relativity is not just an undermining of the idea of absolute simultaneity, but an undermining of the idea of absolute time itself. There is no privileged position or perspective by which we can measure time, that time is fully and utterly dependent upon the measurement of whoever that observer happens to be, whether it's the observer who stayed on Earth or the observer who went one off into the rocket ship. So 20th century discussions about the nature and the structure of time in some way, shape, or form have to wrestle with the implications of relativity theory. So that's the first major event is all the, and then quantum mechanics, of course, makes all of this uh, incredibly more complicated, but maybe a different video for a different time. So that's the first major development. Now let's talk a little bit about McTaggart. John McTaggart was a British philosopher at the turn of the 20th century who in 1908 published the paper called titled The Unreality of Time. Now McTaggart, unlike later philosophers, is not necessarily dealing with the implications of relativity theory. Of course, there's some historical reasons for that. Although McTaggart's paper is published three years after the publication of Einstein's paper, Einstein's Miracle Year that happens in 1905, we're not entirely sure that McTaggart was familiar with that. This is partly because that Einstein doesn't really become that well known outside of Germany until a little bit later. And even then you have some politics because of what's happening with respect between British scientists and philosophers and German scientists and philosophers at the outbreak of the First World War. But leaving all of that aside, the terminology that Metagart's going to use is going to be critically important to understand contemporary philosophy of time. Like I said at the beginning of this video, it's terms that people are still using today. So to begin with, Metagart says that an event refers to the contents of a position in time and that a moment is a position position in time. Now, the question that Metagard's kind of dealing with here is this question of tensed time. When we talk about time in kind of everyday speech, we think about times in terms of the past, the present, and the future. So the philosophical question here is, is the past real? Does the past exist? Has the past existed? Would might be like an epistemological question, but does the past still exist for us in the present moment? Is, is there some sort of ontological significance to the past? And Metagart talks about this question by presenting two different series, A series and B series. Now, Metagart's whole paper is an argument, is sort of a logical argument about why A series just doesn't work. We're going to kind of leave aside that argument and just talk about what A series means and what B series means. So according to Metagart, in the A series, events are ordered as past, present, 
or future. The past are events which have already occurred or are no longer occurring. The past is seen as fixed and unchangeable. You can't go recreate the past or you can't undo decisions and events which have happened in the past. And moving from the past, of course, we come to the present moment. The present is the moment of now. It's what's happening right now at this very moment. And it is, of course, constantly changing as a point of transition between the past and the future. But Taggart argues that the present is elusive and cannot be defi precisely defined because of this constantly shifting nature. Now, for the future, the future refers to events that have not yet occurred, but could or will possibly occur at some point. Now, a strict a serious interpretation would say that the future is probably going to occur, that it will occur. And the future is characterized, unlike the past, the future is characterized by its openness and potentiality because it hasn't occurred yet. In the A series, events and moments are constantly moving from the past to the future or rather from the past to the present and then eventually to the future. And in this sense, proponents of A theory a series hold to it because it's an accurate description of the phenomenology of time, of how we experience time, or at least on the surface level, it seems to be. Now, B series, in contrast to A series, represents a static or kind of frozen view of time. Events in B series are ordered according to different series of temporal relations. As McTaggart says, when we're talking about B series, we talk about events earlier than or events later than other events. So in this respect, B series describes temporal events solely in terms of their relations to each other. There is no inherent flow or passage of time in B series. Instead, it consists of an order or sequence of events without reference to past, present, or future. Again, the past is not a fixed entity. It's simply earlier than our present or your present moment that you're currently experiencing. But Taggart's argument in his article, The Unreality of Time, is that A series, as traditionally understood, is incoherent and leads to different contradictions. But like I said before, the, the importance of McTaggart's article for our purposes is not so much his argument against A series, but the terminology that he uses is, like I said, still in use today. Seen, for example, in the different models of time. And now these different models of time, much like McTaggart's A series and B series, you have A theory of time and B theory of time. Now represented here pictorially is kind of a, a sliding scale from A theory to B theory, so to speak, but bear with me. Hopefully this will make a little bit of sense. So A theory of time emphasizes the dynamic and subjective aspect of time. A theory is often referred to as tensed theory, going back to the past, present, and future distinction, because it incorporates tense or the ideas that events are located in the past, present, future, and that these temporal distinctions are in some way, shape, or form real and objective. According to A theory, the present moment is privileged, and time is seen as constantly flowing or moving from the future to the present and then to the past. The past is fixed, the present is the point of a transition, and the future is open and yet to occur. A theorists today support A theory because it's believed to align with our everyday experience of time, our feeling that time flows and that time moves, where we feel that events happen in the present and where events have happened in the past. Now represented here within A theory and B theory, there are different models. We have kind of pure presentism, which says that the only time that exists is the present moment and that the past and the future don't exist or have no ontological status. You kind of have a hybrid model. Sometimes this is called the growing block theory or the growing past theory. This position says that the, the present moment is still a privileged position in that it's the time that's currently occurring in the sense that it's the time that we are currently experiencing, but that the past is real concrete has an ontological status in that it has happened, although it can't be undone, but we don't yet have the future. So we have an ontological distinction here between the present and the past because it they 
they're, they're real, they've occurred, whereas the future has not yet occurred. So it doesn't have that same ontological status. And then we kind of have our B theory models. B theory is sometimes referred to as tenseless time. Again, B theory holds that those distinctions between past, present, and future have no ontological status. B theory takes a more static perspective of time. It denies the reality of temporal becoming and temporal distinctions like past, present, and future. According to B theory, time is like a block or a timeline in which all events are equally real and exist alongside one another. There is no inherent flow of time and temporal events are ordered in a fixed, tenseless manner. In this view, the distinction between past, present, and future are considered to be illusory or at the very least subjective. B theory challenges our common sense understanding of time and suggests that a perception of temporal flow is the result of cognitive or psychological features rather than inherent features of the universe or fundamental characteristics of time itself. So B theory, pure B theory is often referred to as the block universe in which the past, the present, or the future carry there is no privileged position over and against the other. There is no privileged now. Each individual has their own now. So the now is kind of re reduced to a completely subjective experience of the individual. Some B theorists would interpret this to say that all events that could happen have already happened and that the past still exists. Other B theorists take this as kind of like a product of language that the past has occurred, yes, but it's not like still out there somewhere in time. Going back to the substantivist versus relationist that we talked about earlier, a lot of A theorists would support some view and understanding of substantivism in the sense that time is real, that those ontological categories of past are fundamental characteristics. While if you support some versions of B theory, it's more relational in the sense that we'll talk about the past in relation to the individuals now. The past is what happened earlier than my present moment, my past is related to my present moment, right? So it's highly subjective and individualistic in that regard. But a pure relationist and a pure B theorist wouldn't say that the past is like still out there. In summary, the A theory of time emphasizes the subjective experience of time with past, present, and future distinctions, while the B theory of time presents time as a static and tenseless framework in which all events coexist. These two theories represent different philosophical approaches to understanding the nature of time and have implication for various areas of philosophy, such as metaphysics and the philosophy of language, as well as, of course, discussions about the nature of God. So we can kind of like throw the philosophy of religion in there. Okay, so back to the distinction between substantivist and relativist, relationist, sorry. So we have certain key points of, of the substantivist position. So again, time under this position is an entity is a thing, is a category that has fundamental characteristics or properties to it. And time, again, exists separate, apart from, distinct from other events, such that if nothing were to ever happen, according to the substantivist, time would still exist. Time would still be a thing. Time in this respect is a fundamental feature of reality in the same way that space is a fundamental feature of reality. And that relates to that second point that time is independent from events, that time is not dependent upon events in order for it to exist or in order for time to flow or to occur. Oftentimes, substantivists like Newton posit an absolute absolute sense of time. That's a universal understanding of time that applies uniformly across the universe, across space itself. Substantivism is oftentimes, it, it's, it's compatible with the form of presentism, that the only thing exists is the now, and other positions which privilege the present moment. The key feature here, of course, relates back to that question of ontology. If you think that the past exists, is real, and is still in some sense like out there, then you would be a substantivist, regardless of whether or not you supported like a block theory or growing block theory of the universe. So going back to those models, you could still be a substantivist regardless of whatever model that you chose. You would just kind of maybe have to reword some of the language. I don't know what that would look like for block theory, but I'm sure there's some philosopher out there who's a substantivist but supports the block theory. 
Speaking of philosophers and their support for substantivism or a theory of time, a theory of time has really fallen out of favor over the past hundred years or so, especially since the advent of Einstein and relativity theory. That's not to say that there still aren't a theorist out there. There are. It's just the complications with a theories and with substantivism have become increasingly more problematic and complicated post Einstein. And speaking of Einstein, relativity famously posits sort of a relational position of time in which time is dependent upon or subjective to the particular observer to the extent that within relativity, I have my own time and my own perception of time and you have your own perception of time. Like it's, it's relativity down to the, it's relative down to the most like basic individual level. Additionally, uh, special relativity suggests that time can dilate or contract depending upon the speed, the closer someone gets to the speed of light, for example. And this, of course, means that time is not some universal constant in the Newtonian sense. Time in the relational position is determined by events and the relationship between events, how events relate to each other. That goes back to Metagart's distinction earlier than event A is earlier than event B, but event C is later than event B. But again, that's just dependent upon those particular events. I'm confusing myself with those different examples, but hopefully you get what I mean. And like I said before, relational positions are often observer dependent. This is just the acknowledgement that views perception, the phenomenological perception of time is often regulated just to the individual, that there's no shared absolute perception of time that's shared by multiple people or groups of people. Going back to the twin example, two observers moving at two different velocities will have two different perceptions of time. Another interesting aspect is that time in the relational position is interaction, that it's interactive dependent. That's to say that time can be influenced by physical objects. For example, in general relativity, the mass of an object, specifically a really heavy object, can warp the fabric of space-time, which will in turn affect the flow or the perception of time for the person that's impacted by that gravitational pull. So like I said before, your position on the philosophy of time is really going to boil down to your position on the substantivist versus the relational view of time. And where you fall in that distinction will also influence the various models of time that you either choose to accept or can't accept depending upon your position. I hope that you all enjoyed this discussion on the ontology of time and the different positions that we went through. I'm curious to know what position that you accept. Do you accept a substantivist position of time? Or are you more of a relationalist? Which model of time do you think most accurately describes the universe? If you enjoyed this video, let me know. I'm considering making a part three in which I talk about the psychology and more about the physics of time, maybe even a video in which I talk about things such as the connection between time and meaning making within the life of the individual. Thank you all again for joining me. I look forward to hearing from you in the comments section below and until next time.